And, uh, good morning, everybody. There are no shortage of water-related puns, uh, so there are not many that I haven't heard, but I will give a, a great big kiss to anybody who can think of something uh, new that I haven't heard today. There's a few dotted, dotted throughout my presentation, uh, but please keep them coming. Uh, so thank you for having me here today. Um, my name's Kate Lamb. I'm the head of water for CDP. Uh, we were known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, not quite Climate Disclosure Project. We changed our name because we no longer just solely focus on carbon um, and we do a lot of work with regards to water security and deforestation. The objective of my program is to ultimately catalyse action so that we can improve water security around the world. And before I dive in, um, I wanted to make sure that everybody was clear on the definitions that I've used. So for stranded assets, I'm using the definition that has been uh, developed by Smith School, which is assets that have suffered from unanticipated or premature write-downs, devaluations or conversions to liabilities. And then water security, which I'm aware may be a new phrase for, for some of you in the room. But I'm using the definition that has been coined by the UN in 2013, and that is the capacity of a population to safeguard sustainable access to adequate quantities of acceptable quality water for sustaining livelihoods, human well-being and socio-economic <coughs> development for ensuring protection against waterborne pollution and water-related disasters, and for preserving ecosystems in a climate of peace and political stability. Uh, I want to thank those companies that have taken the time to disclose information to CDP, particularly those that have persistently disclosed over the last six years, those investors that are giving us an awful lot of support in motivating and encouraging and rewarding those companies that are making that effort in disclosing to us, uh, the staff and my team at CDP and, and, and not just Bank Investment Management who have been supporting our work on water security ever since the programme began in 2009 and you all for, for listening today and then obviously going on reading my brilliant paper afterwards. <laughs> um, so I you know, think I want to talk today about the, the rationale for my paper and I'm not going to dive too deeply into the ins and outs of the analysis that I conducted but more share with you some of the stories around how worsening water security in many parts of the world is already stranding some significant uh, assets that you may uh, wish to, to hear about. I'll be giving you a brief overview of what water security is and, and its drivers and, and, and uh, how it's potentially at odds with growth projections around the world, how it's driving stranded assets, uh, some real world examples, I'll give a, an overview of what we might expect into the future, and make some suggestions of further research that we at CDP would like to see conducted uh, and then summarise with my five conclusions that you'll find in the paper. So, um, water is often considered to be an abundant and uh, renewable resource by many. Unfortunately, however, it is a finite resource that is coming under increasing pressure in many parts of the world. And the reasons are relatively straightforward increasing population growth, industrialisation, burgeoning <coughs> middle class, ultimately means that while we, know, we hear, often hear the phrases water scarcity or water stress, essentially water resources are coming under increasing competition from both the public and the private sectors in many parts of the world. And as a result, many businesses are facing a new reality where a fresh supply of water um, and good quality water unfortunately can no longer be guaranteed. And as a result, I think uh, what we're seeing is that there are, there are many risks as a result of this situation, uh, particularly with regards to, to growth projections. In 20, uh, 2014, 22% of the global 500 companies that disclosed to CDP uh, reported that their growth strategies are likely to be affected by water security <coughs> within the next three years. And what my analysis has, has suggests further is that uh, that the, the, the water security may be at odds with growth projections. BP, for example, projects that 30, 36% increase in global energy consumption by 2030. At the same time, the IEA expects water consumption in power generation to rise by 85% by 2035. The UN predicts a 70% increase in food demand by 2050. And mineral consumption is expected to outpace population growth due to increased living standards around the world. And yet at the same time, the 2030 Water Resources Group and McKinsey predicts a global shortfall of water supply by 40% of 40 in the same period. 40%. And this is a situation that is reflected in many parts of the world. Uh, so the pillars that under, underpin society and economic growth are facing a, a quite 
significant challenges and it's something that we are trying to address within CDP and provide a framework for action uh, that supports and enables these very important sectors to succeed and make the contributions to improving water security that will avoid the potential for stranded assets in the future or in fact today. There are concerns about water security in, in, in many parts of the world. India is facing an unprecedented water crisis in it, both its domestic, agricultural and industrial sectors. In Brazil, one of the, the wettest countries in the world, it's experience, experiencing its worst drought in 80 years and it's one of its biggest cities, Sao Paulo, is on the verge of running dry. Uh, China, 60% of its groundwater has been deemed as, uh, as polluted and unfit for human contact. California, we're seeing huge amounts of um, political and regulatory movement in the face of the drought that the, the, the state is facing there. And NASA, uh, recent analysis by NASA suggests that 13 of the, of the world's 37 largest aquifers have reached a point of water depletion where the, the local supply is seriously threatened. So this is, um, the, unfortunately, the distribution of natural resources in some of these countries is again at odds with where its freshwater resources are located. Here we see a, a graph, this is from the World Resources Institute, forgive the, the resolution, you'd be able to see a better one in my report uh, and on their website. This is a, a, a map that demonstrates, uh, visualises the shale gas plays in China over water stress in the country. Now stress, the baseline water stress is defined where 80% of the renewable supplies of water are being used leaving only 20% left. Sorry, I need to address that in my slides. Um, in China, 75% of the total renewable water resources for the country are located in the south of the country. And yet, almost half of the agricultural activities and 86% of the country's coal reserves are located in the north of the country. 50% of all irrigated cropland globally including 57% of global cotton production and 43% of total wheat production are located in high or extremely high water stress locations. Again, that definition is where high or extremely high stress conditions are where 80% of the total renewable resources are already being used and fully allocated. Here in the UK, three quarters of the river basins within the UK are already fully allocated. So what that, the implications of that for growth in, in energy production and agricultural production are really very quite, quite severe. So it's not surprising that water security has been recognised this year as the number one threat to, global, uh, to the global economy um, above the, nuclear, uh, the, 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 the proliferation of nuclear weapons and, and above the, uh, the weapons of mass destruction threat. Uh, this is a, a ranking by World, the, the World Economic Forum. Two years ago, the global water supply crisis was rank number two. The year before that, it was rank number three. The year before that, it didn't even feature in the top 25. And I think that represents uh, the speed at which the awareness of this topic has, has really risen. It has, there has always been a water crisis, typically, but it's been left in the hands of NGOs and governments to deal with because it's generally been placed in the development context. So it's not really been on the, the, the agendas of many businesses for, for, for very long. That situation has changed, um, and I think there's an increasing recognition amongst global investors and businesses that this is no longer a situation that they can take for granted and something needs to change. So CDP, uh, for those of you that don't know, we operate on behalf of a large and growing number of institutional investors, 617 this year, with assets of around $63 trillion worth, uh, $63 trillion. And we issue a questionnaire on their behalf to a range of companies from a range of sectors where they're very highly dependent upon water. Because it's important to reflect that this issue isn't relevant to every single sector, of course. But we focus our efforts and our time on those sectors where we believe it is and could potentially be an issue. Um, in 2014, I've taken the 2014 data that was disclosed to us. We invited 2,300 companies in total to disclose. 1,064 companies did respond. These are the examples of some of the industry sectors that we target. And I've taken the data from 174 of the world's largest companies for, for, our, for my analysis in the paper today. And I'm introducing this concept of drying and drowning assets. One of the questions we ask in our questionnaire is, are you exposed or is your business exposed to substantive water-related risks that may generate a substantive change in your business revenue operations? 
um, or expenditure. 68% of these companies say yes to that question. And when they say yes, they're then asked to provide further information about that, the, about the risks. Uh, and this is the table that they have to fill in. It's a relatively big one, and I do often sympathise with the companies that are confronted with this question, but the data that they provide is, is really quite amazing. And we work very closely with the likes of WRI to ensure that when companies use WRI's tools, they can automatically upload the, the response data into our framework. They provide us information about the location of those risks. Uh, they provide us information about the, the different drivers and the potential business impact of those risks, as well as a description of the, the, uh, the risks, so the likelihood, the magnitude, the time frame, the potential financial impacts, and then ultimately also what they're doing about it and the cost of those strategies. For the, for the research that I'm presenting in my paper, I've focused on the four key do uh, boxes that are highlighted in yellow. We've looked at those risk factors across metals and mining, oil and gas, and electric utility sectors that may have the, the greatest potential to strand assets. Uh, there are three tables like this in my paper. Uh, this is the, the third and final one. Um, but overall, from that analysis, we've established that a range of physical, regulatory, governance, and reputational factors are likely to strand assets in these sectors. And it's important to reflect again, this is the perception of the companies themselves. Um, there's an interesting piece of research, I believe, that to be had to test the, per the perception of these companies versus the reality of the situation that we're facing. Uh, what we've noticed is that some of the risk assessment processes that the companies are doing to establish the answers to those questions could uh, be improved quite significantly. Many of them are failing to account for some of the significant risk drivers at a river basin or a, or a catchment level that would ultimately drive these risks. Of those that are disclosed to us, however, the majority of the risk factors are of medium to high magnitude and also the majority of them are likely to fall within the next three years. And the majority of these risk factors have the potential to temporarily or permanently strand assets in at least one sector, but in significantly in the metals and mining sector. And you can see the different types of risk factors presented on the, the right hand side. So some of the stories to, to help bring this to life, because this issue is affecting business today and there have been instances of asset stranding already. Barrett Gold may be an example that some of you are very familiar with. They have a Pascual Lama mine, it's in Peru, uh, and sorry, in Chile. And the company had invested five billion in the development of the mine before they were able to uh, secure their license they needed to abstract the water that they need to ultimately develop the mine. Unfortunately, they were unable to provide the regulators with the confidence that they needed to, uh, to the, 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 with, that they would manage their water-related impacts, particularly on groundwater pollution. And so the regulator chose not to give them the license to abstract their water. And it wasn't because there was not enough water there. That's really important to remember. There was, but they just didn't provide the confidence that the, invest, that the regulator needed to grant them that license. And as a result, that asset is now stranded temporarily and should the company be able to provide that investor, the regulator with confidence, then they're likely to get their, their license and it will no longer be a stranded asset. But at the moment, right now it is, and there is $27 billion worth of gold and silver remaining in the ground uh, that is no longer being exploited uh, and generating the nice returns that many of you in the room might expect. Excellent. Uh, this is an example where worsening water security is drowning, uh, drying an asset. In 2013, the company reported to us that they were closing uh, their nuclear power plant at the Oyster Creek uh, 10 years early. This is 10 years before their actual license uh, from the Nuclear Regulator Committee is uh, set to run out. This was driven by tightening water withdrawal regulations implemented by the EPA. It would have cost the company 800 million to upgrade their plant in order to meet the more stringent regulations and so the decision was taken to shut the plant down 10 years early. They also report to us that there are likely 11 other facilities that will be affected by this regulation and they're working through that at the moment. So this plant will be closed in 2019 instead of 2029. Here's an example of how water is drowning assets. This is from Anadarko Petroleum who disclosed to investors via CDP that in 2013 in, in Colorado there was a, a, a huge flood and the company had to close down 675 of their fracking wells. Uh, they didn't disclose to us how much 
that cost them. Um, but with a little bit of research and investigation and reading some other responses from, from companies within the same sector, so their peers, um, the, one of their peers in the disclosure below them, I remember seeing it in the spreadsheet, said the average industry revenue loss from a closure of, a, of, a, of one single well uh, per day is ranges between forty and $70,000. I thought, great, that's a, a nice piece of information that I need. Uh, Anadarko didn't tell us how long these wells were closed for, but I can imagine it was longer than a week, but I thought, let's be conservative and we'll assume that they were closed down for just a week. Um, on the average industry, uh, revenue losses, we can estimate that it was likely to cost the company between 810 million to 1.5 billion per week for the shutdown of those individual wells. Now those wells are back up and running, so again this was a case of temporary stranding uh, as a result of water related issues. The company had prepared for it, they knew that this was likely to happen, um, but they still were unable to, to manage that risk unfortunately. So should we expect more in the future? I think uh, the evidence certainly suggests that, that we should. Um, some research from WRI suggests that there's 1,199 coal fired power plants proposed in 59 <coughs> countries. The majority of this capacity is forecast to happen in India and China, ranked second and eighth on WRI's current water stress uh, index. 75%, oh sorry, I covered that point. And finally, according to Moody's, 70% of the six biggest global, uh, global miners' existing mines are in countries where water stress is rated as high or moderate, along with two thirds of projects that are currently slated for future development. WRI have just released some really very interesting uh, research, I would recommend that you, you get your hands on it if you can, where they've looked at it forecasting using IPC, IPPC projections, what future water stress is likely to look like in 2020, 2030 and 2040. And there are around 33 countries where they're anticipating that the status will change to high or extremely high water stress, including, and I've written them down because I've got a terrible memory, Chile, Estonia, Namibia and Botswana, all of those uh, with, with high potential for, for growth. In addition, at CDP, we've tried to begin to get quick companies to think about the implications of this issue for their, for their growth strategy and begin to prepare for this and transform their business so that they can be prepared and continue to be successful. It's important to reflect that we don't want these companies to fail necessarily. Um, we do want them to continue and be part of the solution. This is a question, have you evaluated how water risk could affect the success of your, uh, or const uh, this is the viability or constraint of your organisation's growth strategy? And you can see across the sectors that there's certainly work to still be done. Of particular concern are the numbers of companies that have not yet evaluated this issue, or in fact that have also failed to provide a response to this specific question. Uh, we can provide this information to you and if you're engaging with these companies, I would advise that this is probably something that you should be talking to them about. What is the correct response? Well, I think for some of these sectors, technology and significant capex and opex will be uh, potentially the saviour. Um, we're seeing increases in spend across all of these sectors, 7% a year in food and bev, 14% a year in oil and gas, and 50% a year in metals and mining. And where once for metals and mining, the cost of water was around 10% of a total mine's cost. In 2013, that price rose to 30%. Um, the investment overall in water, secure, in water infrastructure for the sector in 2009 was 3.4 billion. In 2013, it was 13 billion. It's a 256% increase in, in investment in water. Um, but it's important to reflect again that it wasn't a lack of money or technology that necessarily led to the stranding of some of these assets. And so I have a phrase, it's no good, it's no good being a clean fish in a dirty pond. No amount of capex investment that can potentially give the regulators the confidence and the local communities the confidence that these companies are going to succeed. So um, I think it's no longer you're no longer able to make assumptions that water availability and access will be granted to you. Corporate water stewardship, however, is emerging as the framework for meaningful action, and that's certainly the direction that we propose and support companies in taking, looking beyond their fence lines and investing in ways in which they can delivers water security for the broad ba broader basin that they're operating in. And I think as investors, the role that you have is in, in signaling to those companies that that's okay by you, that you support them in that objective, and that ultimately delivers long-term business resilience for these companies. Uh, for Moody's, uh, they're anticipating that projects will take longer to complete 
be costlier and riskier with credit negative implications for the entire metals and mining industry. Environmental factors such as water scarcity could adversely affect the ratings of global mining companies if they fail to proactively manage the accompanying operational and political risks to their business. Some further areas of research that I'd love uh, to work with anybody on, uh, anybody with a little bit of additional resource that can help us out with this is very welcome. As I mentioned earlier, testing the perception versus the reality of these risk drivers is something that is very worthwhile and something we're talking to Lloyd's Register about. We also ask questions of companies about the scenario analysis that they're exploring. Um, we'd love to test those a little bit more, but we haven't had time. And also the establishment of catchment-based water budgets. And the way that we have uh, the establishment of carbon budgets, we can do the same thing for water where the data is uh, where it's appropriate. And that would be an important piece of data to inform the growth strategies of companies in key regions. So five conclusions very quickly. Water-related risk factors are material and are already stranding assets in some sectors. The potential exposure to stranded assets is, is currently being exac exacerbated by increasing growth, which is also driving up asset valuations to record highs in many markets. Understanding water-related risks to assets can help investors, businesses and policymakers develop effective risk management and water stewardship strategies, which can improve resilience, minimise value at risk and improve conditions ultimately for local communities. Water-related risk factors may not lead to stranded assets in all cases, providing assumptions are made about water availability and access prove accurate, regulatory responses are anticipated and risk mitigation plans are put in place. And finally, the opportunity costs associated with adapting to and managing water-related risks should not be underestimated. As with risk, the amount of value to be secured globally is really significant and I look forward to working with many of you in the room to ensure that that value is realised. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll just stay there for a few minutes here. We'll collect, uh, you can ask questions of uh, broad nature as well as clarification nature. Um, it's interesting that uh, you bring in the water dimension. You didn't mention the nexus word that floats around our institute constantly. Um, some of you may be tired of hearing that term, but clearly there's a connection. Absolutely. Food, energy, water, uh, and climate. Uh, yes, let me see a showing of hand first. Uh, I see three questions here, one in the back, and one there. So we'll start at the front this time. Yes. Hi, Kate. Thank you for that. It was a great overview. You. Uh, you didn't mention the hydro sector, which has actually been very heavily impacted by long term drought. Um, and of course, that crosses uh, corporate and um, government level uh, standard assets. Um, so it's been very common over the last 20 years that large hydro schemes have had to reduce generation due to long-term drought. And it has actually hit GDP level um, in countries. Um, so recently you have the World Bank assisting Uruguay to actually arrange an insurance policy to cover the risk in its hydro sector. Because in the past um, they've had to import oil very large amounts uh, to cover shortages of generation. Um, and so their insurance product basically is there now to try and cover some of that risk whilst they've got health mm -hmm. So the impacts can be very large. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Captain. Sorry. Also, a quick uh, sectorial question. Um, did you, by any chance, also look at, at the agricultural sector, especially on the regional impacts on the agricultural, agricultural sector of, the, um, of droughts, etc.? Um, we, no, um, is, is the answer. Um, generally, due to a lack of data within our data set that would deliver that, we have responses from food and beverage companies, for example, that rely on those resources, right, but they don't necessarily own those assets themselves. Um, and so where they perceive to be uh, exposed to risk, we do have that information, but I haven't been able to dive into that, unfortunately, but I'd be happy to share it with you if you'd like to do that yourself. <laughs> This goes back to the nexus uh, point that you mentioned. What's, uh, have you, there, you probably don't have much data in terms of the Middle East, but mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, in discussions with leaders there, there's a big level of interest in terms of addressing the desalination issues, et cetera. Do you, could that potentially provide some momentum going back to the nexus question? And also, just 
from that you talked a lot about the, the challenges that you know some of these companies are facing or, or creating. Uh, is there any kind of shining examples of you know companies that are making good progress uh, in, in terms of helping on the water side? You know, what yeah. are the sort of gold standard? That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, the Middle East is an incredibly interesting area for the, the nexus. Um, we're seeing, I think it's roughly around 10% of the, the fossil fuel use in the, in the region is used to desalinate and provide the water that is needed to power the economy and that is likely to only increase. Um, desalination, I think, is a, a solution in many parts of the world. It is, however, incredibly resource intensive. Um, and I don't think there could be enough investment in the design and uh, the R&D of that particular technology to make it more efficient. But that's really only successful in regions where you may be close to the sea. Um, if you're not, uh, then you have to pump the water incredibly long distances, which does make it economically unviable in many circumstances. <coughs> One of the interesting impacts of desalination in the Middle East has actually been the, develop is the development of, um, what are they called, red, uh, uh, red tides. So when the desalination has been happening, the fresh water is sent and used beautifully. But the wastewater, so the incredibly saline wastewater, has been dumped back into the sea, which is really on the doorstep of where they're calling, <coughs> pulling, pulling their water from. And so red tides are developed, which are then sucked into the desalination plants, causing those desalination plants to fail. Um, it is a very fine and unique balance that we're trying to strike here, and I think we shouldn't underestimate how much awareness and, and knowledge is needed to understand how these systems rely upon one another. And there are instances of trade-offs and linkages being made constantly and, and that we again we have a, a robust data set of companies with reporting where they're having to make these trades off and linkages and again it's a, another area of, of significant research to be undertaken I think. For um, <coughs> shining lights there are a few there aren't many unfortunately um, we've scored and ranked all of our companies this year and we'll be releasing the results in uh, just a matter of uh, just under a month now uh, it's the first time we've done it and there are only nine leaders out of all of the companies that we've responded, uh, that we've scored. Uh, so there is, there is progress for sure. And I think there's some examples like uh, Sasol, an oil and gas uh, and chemical company in South Africa. They recognize that they, their, their access to water was a threat for uh, their plants in the Vaal River system. And their original idea was that they would just invest in digging l larger boreholes and <coughs> securing their own water supply within the fence line. They had a very forward-thinking water manager who looked beyond the fence line to figure out what was happening in the Vaal River system and why was <coughs> their, their access under threat. And they identified that meant three of the big townships in the area were suffering from substantial water loss, 50-60% leakage rates, the water was running down the streets. And Sassol took the decision that rather than investing in their own boreholes, they would actually invest in improving the leakage rates within those cities within those townships. So they put new new pipes in, they stopped the leaks, and that has had huge social benefits. It's given them great PR credentials and ultimately has given them a great standing within the community so that they can command the social license to operate that they needed, but also a more confidence with the regulators that the regulator should, they still haven't got it yet, but they should give them the license that they need to continue to expand their businesses. Nestle are engaging 40,000 farmers in Vietnam all of their coffee growers uh, to ensure and uh, educate those farmers in the process and manners of uh, sustainable agricultural water use. So moving them from sort of spraying water right across all the plants with buckets to, to drip irrigation. That's a, a really significant opportunity for Nestle. It secures their, uh, their supply of, of coffee beans, but ultimately also enhances water security uh, within uh, Vietnam. So there are a few. You might have enough here for a whole stranded assets conference on water, <laughs> um, but we don't have quite that much time here. So we've got two questions in the back that are soft. Please keep them brief as well as the response. Yeah, sorry to take up just to go along of the uh, knowledge of these things. Uh, uh, new coal plants in uh, Indonesia, Turkey, and uh, uh, in India, though, um, and three countries in particular, where there were huge amounts of uh, new coal plants. Do you, do you get a feeling that the authorities there, the regulators, and the politicians are on top of the water, uh, water issues? Um, I would suggest that so water has always been governed. There are many places there are effective policies in place, but they're not necessarily 
implemented very effectively. Um, and so where you will have, a, even here in the UK, um, there is very effective legislation, but unfortunately there are not enough members of staff in the enforcement agencies to enforce that legislation and the licenses agreements. I think in some respects, some governments have been caught off guard by the, the, the growth in awareness of this issue amongst business. And so in many cases, businesses are moving faster. But there are instances where policy, this situation is so severe that the policymakers are moving much faster than they have in the past to ultimately manage and sustain water. Uh, because there really is no replacement for this. There are replacements <coughs> and alternatives to fossil fuels, but there is no replacement for water. And so I think we'll see regulation moving much faster and becoming perhaps more stringent, uh, in particularly in those regions. Okay, and then the very back, and then we'll move to the next. Uh, Kate, uh, you mentioned a template for water budgets at the very end. And Cabot Creamery did one of these in their sustainability report a few years ago. Uh, a guy named Mark McElroy at Sustainable Organizations did it. It might be a neat example for you to use in the report. Thank you, John. That's very helpful. We've been working with TNC and uh, the Pacific Institute on that particular topic to try and understand how we can take that forward. I think it would be an incredibly valuable piece of information that you could then use to establish who's projecting to grow in this one location and how are we going to allocate that resource and how, 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 how much can we guarantee that they will get it. There's a lot more work needed in that area. Well, thanks so much, Kate. For Thank you.